this is this is just an introduction to a panel discussion that that is uh, coming up afterwards. And uh, in Afrikaans, there's a there's an expression. In the land van die blinders is die een oog koning. Now, for many years, I was the, the one-eyed king of biosecurity, but now we've got a real vet sitting at the back who is one of a handful of small stock uh, production specialists. I don't know what they called it, but, but she, she's got a, she specialized after her initial six years and is a an actual specialist in small stock disease and, and, and production. So I really feel usually inadequate and inappropriate for me to stand here and speak in her presence. So you can excuse yourself. I feel a lot more comfortable. <laughs> I'll call you back for the panel discussion. <laughs> so no, I, I, we, are, we, we are very fortunate to have Arena uh, with us. So I, I thought to, to look into the future is, is extremely difficult if you don't look at, at the past and, and where we were. And, and, and we started 2019, uh, which was when we first heard of the foot and mouth outbreak in, in, in that last week of January in 2019. And, and that like the Rift Daily Fever outbreak of 2010, set everybody uh, thinking and meetings were held and, and things were established and, and working groups were, were formed and stuff. But, but that's where we were then. And, and, and we identified in, at that uh, 2019 meeting. So we identified various areas of concern uh, starting with 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 what i believe is one of the cornerstones of our, our biosecurity uh loop and that is obp and at that stage there was a severe lack of confidence from the farmer's side uh because of lack of management at obp at that stage they didn't have a, a full-time ceo they had a rotating system where they had a new ceo every every two months, I think. So the whole of the executive of, of OBP were, were acting as CEOs on a rotating basis. I remember we went up there for a meeting once and we, the, the chap we spoke to the, was not a vet at all. He was the human resources uh, director. So he was acting as CEO for those two months. The next time it was somebody else. It was the financial director. So that, that, was, it, that was chaos, we felt. and, and um, there was also problems with a Rift Daily Fever vaccine, which, which uh, there was some doubt about the efficiency of that vaccine that they produced during the 2010-11 outbreak. And it was confirmed. No, it, it, we, we, we still have our doubts of, of the efficiency of that particular vaccine. Uh, not the, not the, the antigen, but the, the adjuvant that they put with it is, is under, I've been told that, that it wasn't entirely uh, 100% rare, but that was sorted out uh, subsequent to that, and I'll get to that later on. Death during the, as you can remember, during that 2019 uh, foot and mouth outbreak, it was impossible, it just absolutely impossible to speak to anybody in Pretoria. Uh, I'm talking about Dr. Modisani or Dr. Maja. Uh, they just referred the industry, and the industry was was in that at that stage the wool buying industry, the Savamba. They couldn't speak to these people, and and they blocked the export of wool. They referred all the the the, the queries or the questions were referred to the Animal Health Forum. Said speak to the Animal Health Forum. We don't want to speak to you. So so that was a that was a problem, and. Uh, the Animal Health Forum in itself was focused focusing in, in, only on, on sorting out the, the outbreak up in, uh, in the Northern Transvaal. They weren't really interested in, in exp helping us with the export of wool. And, and I, I could understand that because there was a crisis, a much bigger crisis amongst the, the cattle farmers up north. And, and uh, the, 
state and the provincial vets down here also the same thing we didn't re although we identified it at, at before that and we started talking to them it things weren't in place by then it's amazing that we actually before the foot and mouth outbreak we had a meeting uh, with the state vets uh, and we identified this as a potential problem so the wheels were already in motion by the time of the outbreak but nothing was in place yet so so that was that was two years ago and, and things weren't looking great uh now let's deal with with obp first we i, I don't say it's been sorted out but it's a lot better than it was two years ago it's a lot better uh the ceo who was appointed dr dungu i've got the a huge amount of respect for him he he's run into problems with his employer uh i hope it will be sorted out i think it will be and i can i can share with you what happened there dr dungu was a congolese and and he he's in, he was put in charge of a of a critical institution in south africa and and it's uh, apparently without it's it's against the law apparently foreigners aren't allowed to hold positions like that irrespective of his qualifications or not and then also he has got a uh, he's got a, a he had a interest in a company in scotland and they say that there's a conflict of interest which is absolute rubbish i mean he, there's no ways that he would would be involved with things like that but anyway I hope and trust that Dr. Dungu will be reappointed, that this will be sorted out. And OBP is rightly a critical part of the South African biosecurity loop. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't be with the Department of Agriculture. It should be somewhere else. It should be, it should be placed differently through there. It should be put with a presidency or something like that. But then you get a, a president who is not capable of doing his job. And then you, then you, everybody says you should have left it at, at agriculture. So <laughs> it's difficult with these things. It's difficult. Dr. Favut was appointed as a, uh, for food as a industry. We, I mean, for years and years and years, we tried to get an industry board member at OBP. Eventually we got one uh, through the Animal Health Forum. So communication was improved vastly with OBP, vastly. It was much better. The Rift Valley fever vaccine was uh, quality tested and, and it, it came through with flying colors of the, the present batches that they used. So uh, we carry on and we, we look at, at the department, at, at DEF, at the, and I cannot say that we've made any progress there. Dion, do you think you have? Uh, Leon? No, no, at, at higher up with Dr. Marisani and, and Dr. Marjo. Yeah, I can, all, all that I can say is In terms of communication. Good communication. Is there with the Animal Health Forum? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Every quarter, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, gentlemen, let's continue. The Animal Health Forum, it's grown over the last two years into a, becoming a more efficient, smaller body. Uh, and it's busy with these VPNs, which I believe if, if they are accepted by DAF and if they, but it's a step forward, but it comes to implementation. And that is the problem. The problem is, is you can have all these plans and the papira and the, the manuals can be thick. And that comes, brings it back to the previous slide. I'm not sure that implementation at, from DEF is what it should be. I don't know if they've got the resources to implement, but I mean, they, they, we can discuss that at, at the forum afterwards because that's, oh, those are opinions and, and, and I could be wrong. With agri SA during that foot and mouth outbreak, you know, we tried every single channel. I say we are talking about Cape Bulls. You try to, through, facilitate with the export of wools of wool which was blocked trying to get the the export certificate the veterinary health certificate sorted out and if eventually uh savamba and cape wools uh savamba first joined agri essay through through agbus or, and uh, 
and that's that's uh, that's improved communications on that side and once you once you get structures like agri sa to help you it helps a lot to, if you want to communicate with with government so we've learned from that and i think uh um Herman, in future that kind of cooperation with agri sa and and agbiz will will definitely help uh, with with communicating and trying to sort out uh, problems in future but this this slide this is where we actually made huge progress over the last two years and that is creating a a ppp a private public partnership with uh the provincial veterinary departments and that is to facilitate exports of wool i think that is that helps i mean that that a huge improvement has happened there in both in terms of communication with Bishu, as well as with the establishment of an export uh, dedicated wool export vet uh, with the, we had a, a community service vet uh, allocated to Cape Wools last year. So that, that, that gives one a lot of confidence for, for going forward as far as exporting wool during a crisis. It's important to keep this intact though keep the, the relationship going. And, and this is just the beginning. I mean, it, you, because it, you, you, you don't work with a system, you work with people. So the next guy who replaces the current uh, chief, the same process has to, be, and the, has to be done and the confidence has to be built and the communication has to be maintained. It's, it's almost a full-time job. And with that in mind, I may, with Herman's permission, may I, say that that, that Cape Wools has, has made funds available or, or not it's not it's it's from the risk levy to actually employ a dedicated vet to basically continue full-time discussion with the provincial structures and obviously uh, above that as well but I think that's important it, it, you've got something in place today tomorrow there's a new person in head office in Bishu or in Pretoria, and you have to start the whole process again. So it's a continuous lobbying process. And we think well, Cape Wools thought it was important enough to actually consider a point using the, rift, the, the risk uh, levy to look for somebody to do that on an almost full-time basis. Uh, then new initiatives over the last two years the the, the wool value chain roundtable was created during that uh, there, there were other value chain roundtables in place before then they, we created a wool one which and dion will tell you a lot more about it and uh you know you what you part of it so you you, you know what i can't speak, i'll drop further if you want to elaborate on that uh we've through SK, uh, it, it was probably it wasn't intentional, but we've 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 uh, added a, a, an independent director to to Cape Wool's board, who happens to be a, a, a veterinarian, which which is a bit of a bonus, I think, for, with my vet cap on. I think <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> okay. Anyway, on the support Veterinary Institute, um, we started talking to them on, on doing some foot and mouth research for us. And that also opened our eyes to the huge, huge, huge restraints that that institute is, 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 is dealing, is operating under. It's, it's things aren't going well, people. These, this is a, another critical uh, lab. It, it does all the, the serology that comes in from, from the foot and mouth outbreak areas. So they do the diagnosis and they do the tests and they hugely understaffed. And the researchers are disappearing to, to Australia, to England and who knows where else. Then we initiated a joint project with Australia through the uh, Wool Trade Biosecurity Working Group. That's the IWTO initiative, which is which is which is good because it means that that uh, uh, working group is 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 functioning. 
We've got the sustainable wool certification, which goes back to traceability, which is a fantastic tool in terms of biosecurity and, and, and uh, tracing, tracing wool. And that's a, the, 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 one of the key, keys to biosecurity is traceability. And that is why we can export wool, despite a, an emergency disease outbreak in South Africa, despite the fact that we have lost our foot and mouth status, and we will be able to export wool even if we have PPR. And no matter, I think we'll be able to export wool no matter what disease happens in South Africa because of the traceability and, and because of the trust in our traceability system that the Chinese veterinary authorities have. And uh, then the last one I've, I've talked on is the risk fund. Um, so the, currently the OBP uncertainty continues. Uh, the Honestport Veterinary Institute, as I've mentioned that. Honestport, uh, the veterinary faculty as a as a alternative point for research. I've we've. My personal opinion is, I don't think it's it's a teaching institution is not a research institution. That the two don't don't often work together. Uh, I've mentioned that. So I think we can move on. We have, in, we have now at that last point, the PPR clause has been approved by the OIE. Uh, it was submitted when I wrote that slide, it's been approved. So now we can rewrite our export certificate. So if there is an outbreak, uh, hopefully there won't be, but then we will, should be able to export wool. Uh, the way forward, and and this is basically so what i've basically said now is that it's almost like relying on the police to protect you on your farm it's it's a bit of a risk so it's the same to rely on government to protect your farm from from emergency animal diseases i wouldn't do that i, I really They've, they've got a proven track record of not looking after our borders in the last few years of, of foot and mouth coming in. So yes, they are important. And yes, we do have a police service, but most farmers make use of private security companies nowadays to, to track their sheep and to look after them. And you've, you've got, and you've got other systems in place to look after your personal security on your farms. And I think the same happens, the same goes for biosecurity. You, it, it starts on your own farm, it, the, the, the state vet in, in your area and the stock inspectors are not going to keep your farm clean if you don't do your bit. You're the only person who can, who can do it. Um, and, uh, okay, this is, as far as uh, the Cape Wool's, um, responsibility goes is is to continue participation in the value chain uh strengthen our export permits continue dialogue with our our, our, our provincial vets and with our, our, our central the with deaf i've been deaf is much easier to say uh and uh, but to close the loop the biosecurity loop and this is what I said just now, it comes back to the farmer. It's what do you allow on your farm? Do you trust your breeder? Do you, uh, when you have a feedlot, do you keep records of where you buy in your, your animals from? Where, what's the source of your, your animals? Uh, that, is, that is basically what we must do, is to look after our own animals. And Cape Wools will do its best to look after the export of the product of your of your wool during an outbreak. But when 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 this when and it's not only foot and mouth and it's not only PPR. It's it's things like stonies, uh lice, brandsicter, mange. Right? Those are the things. I mean, in, in, in my district, Caledon, we've, we've, Caledon is well known for Jonies, but I can guarantee you that we lose a lot more due to lice than we do to Jonies in, in the over 
because every third farm, every third year has to dip for lice. And you only start dipping once you start seeing that the, the sheep are biting in there. <laughs> and then you, but then you've already lost. You've lost the production and you've lost in, in reproduction. And lice is, lice is, is biosecurity. That's all it is.